Hello and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the life of Margie Velma Barfield, a controversial case of a serial killer who became known in the press as Death Row Granny, and whether she was indeed a heartless monster, or a woman who was so befuddled by her addiction to prescription medication that she went to extraordinary lengths to get her hands on her next fix. Margie Velma Bullard, who always went by her middle name of Velma, was born on the 29th of October 1932 in South Carolina, America. She was the second child and first daughter of the nine children born to Murphy and Lillian Bullard. The family lived in harsh, cramped conditions near Fayetteville in North Carolina where they had no electricity, running water or access to any form of outhouse or toilet. During the Great Depression, they fell further into poverty and Velma's childhood was far from being a happy one. Her father, Murphy, was a strict imposing man who was easily angered and drank heavily. He had a quick temper and was hysterically jealous of his wife whilst being repeatedly unfaithful himself. Lillian feared her husband's temper and remained submissive to him at all times, doing nothing to protect her children from their father's wrath. Velma would often forgive her father for his outbursts and violence, justifying his behaviour as typical of a man. But then she would remain angry at her mother for failing to protect her. In 1939, at the age of seven, Velma started school. She achieved good grades and enjoyed her time there, as it gave her a respite from her bleak home life. However, Before long, she became a target for other children to bully, picking on her due to her family's poverty. As a result of this, she began sneaking out of school and on one occasion was caught stealing money from an elderly neighbour. She was beaten by her father and there were no further known incidents of theft during her childhood. Despite the violent outbursts, Velma was often perceived as being daddy's little girl. His oldest daughter becoming his favourite, It was many years later that Velma stated that her father had been sexually abusing her during this time, a fact that was vehemently denied by her brothers, but supported by at least one of her sisters. On the 1st of December 1949, at the age of 17, Velma married her school sweetheart. He was 18-year-old Thomas Burke, and this provided her with an escape route from her family home. Thomas had various different jobs, working in a cotton mill, as a farm labourer and driving a delivery truck, whilst Velma worked in a pharmacy. They welcomed their first child on the 15th of December 1951, a boy who they named Ronald, and then two years later, in September 1953, their daughter Kim was born. Velma loved being a mother. She was indulgent and protective, and enjoyed spending time with her children. When they started school, she would always be one of the first to volunteer to help out. By this time, Thomas had got a job as a delivery driver for Pepsi-Cola, and Velma worked at night at a nearby textile plant. This gave them enough money to move to a small but comfortable house in Parkton, where they enjoyed many happy years of family life. This began to change when, at the young age of 31, Velma had to have a hysterectomy, The operation had a profound and negative effect on her well-being and her personality changed quite drastically as a result. She became anxious and depressed and began to suffer from other ailments, including severe back pain. At around the same time, Thomas had been drinking more, something that Velma had always been opposed to, and in 1965, Thomas had a car accident. He was knocked unconscious after falling asleep at the wheel, but Velma believed that it was because he had been drinking and their relationship began to deteriorate into a series of bitter arguments. Two years later, Thomas was arrested for drunk driving and as a result he lost his driver's licence and along with it, his job at Pepsi-Cola. He fell into a depression and as a result began drinking even more heavily. This situation also took a toll on Velma, who was dealing with her own physical and mental illnesses. She became ever more anxious and was quickly losing weight. 
At one point after collapsing at home, she was hospitalised for a week and then discharged with a prescription for Librium, a psychotropic drug which is used to treat anxiety disorders which is now known to be habit forming. After being discharged from hospital, she began taking Librium in higher doses than what she had been prescribed and also began getting treatment from other doctors for this and other medications. Each doctor was unaware of the other and her drug use began to increase. As her drug addiction took hold, her children often found their mother passed out and would hunt for her hidden pill bottles and throw them away just as Velma herself was searching for and disposing of the alcohol which Thomas was hiding. On the 21st of April 1969, whilst the children were at school, Velma returned from the laundrette to find that her house was on fire. There was minimal fire damage, but inside, 38-year-old Thomas was found dead. He had died from asphyxiation together with the family dog, Termite, and cat, Sadie. It was deemed that the fire had been caused by Thomas smoking whilst in bed, drunk. Not long after Thomas's death, Velma began dating a widow by the name of Jennings Barfield. Jennings' wife had died around the same time as Thomas. He was 16 years older than Velma and had retired early from his career in the civil service due to his ill health, having been diagnosed with diabetes, emphysema and heart disease. Velma and Jennings married on the 23rd of August 1970, but were soon having marital troubles, particularly due to Velma's addiction to medication. It seemed that divorce was on the cards, but on the 21st of March 1971, Jennings died from heart failure. In order to support herself, Velma began working at Belk's department store but her poor performance and attitude led to her being removed from the shop floor into the stockroom before ultimately being sacked. At around this time, her father died and she was arrested for forging a prescription for which she was given a suspended sentence. Three years later, in the summer of 1974, Velma's mother, Lillian, became very ill with intense diarrhoea and vomiting. She recovered within a few days, only for the symptoms to return over the Christmas period that year. She was admitted to hospital on 30th December 1974 and sadly died within hours. Shortly before her death, Lillian had spoken to one of her sons expressing concern about a letter that she had received saying that if she did not pay her car loan, her car would be repossessed. She was worried because she did not have a car loan, but her son reassured her that it was likely just an administration error. However, it was later discovered that this was a loan that Velma had taken out whilst pretending to be Lillian. A year later, Velma was convicted of seven counts of writing bad checks, which she was doing in order to finance her prescription drug habit, and was then sentenced to six months in prison. She served three months of her sentence and after her release decided to seek employment looking after the elderly. She began caring for 94-year-old Montgomery Edwards and his wife Dolly who was 84. Montgomery was bedridden and incontinent, had diabetes which had led to the amputation of both of his legs and was blind. Dolly was a cancer survivor who at 84 struggled with the care of her husband. On the 29th of January 1977, Montgomery died after a bout of what was thought to be gastroenteritis. At his age and with his extensive medical problems, his death was not unexpected. Just over a month later, Dolly began experiencing the same symptoms as her husband, extreme stomach pain and violent sickness and diarrhoea. Dolly died on the 1st of March 1977. Velma began dating a relative of Dolly's, Stuart Taylor, a widower and tobacco farmer. She also took a job caring for a 76-year-old by the name of Record Lee, who had broken her leg. When Record and her 80-year-old husband, John, found that a cheque had been cashed in their name, they called the police. But with no knowledge as to the source of the cheque, this wasn't pursued. Just a couple of months later, John became ill with extreme stomach pains, diarrhoea and sickness. He was taken to hospital where he remained for a week with what was determined to be a virus. Once he was discharged, his symptoms would come and go at regular intervals until, on the 4th of June 1977, he was taken to hospital with stomach and chest pains where he finally succumbed to his illness. 
Meanwhile, Velma and Stuart were planning to marry. They regularly attended the Sunday service in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and it was during one such visit that Stuart was taken ill. Convinced that he had an upset stomach from something that he had eaten, Stuart went back to his truck to wait for Velma. By the time the service had finished and Velma returned to the truck, Stuart was in agony and Velma took him to the local hospital. Stuart was diagnosed with gastroenteritis, prescribed some medicine and sent home. His condition began to improve before suddenly taking a turn for the worse. Stuart was suffering from extreme vomiting and diarrhoea. He was sweating profusely and was thrashing about in bed making incoherent noises. On the 3rd of February 1978, he was rushed back to the hospital but died within an hour of his arrival. Puzzled by this seemingly healthy man's sudden death, the doctors requested that an autopsy was performed. Whilst awaiting the results of the autopsy, Detective Benson Phillips of the Lumberton Police Department received a call from a woman who stated that there had been not one but several murders. Initially dismissing this as a prank call, the detective began to take these claims more seriously when the woman called for a second time and not only mentioned Stuart's death but also the fact that Velma had killed her mother. The caller was one of Velma's sisters. When the results of the autopsy were finalised, it was concluded that Stuart had died from arsenic poisoning. On the 13th of May 1978, Velma was arrested and charged with Stuart's murder. After her arrest, the body of her second husband, Jennings Barfield, was exhumed and was also found to contain traces of arsenic. She later confessed to murdering her mother, John Lee, and Montgomery and Dolly Edwards. She admitted that in each case she had laced her victim's food and drink with either Singletary Rat Killer or Terror Ant and Roach Killer. These are both odourless and tasteless substances that she had bought at a local store for about one dollar per can. She maintained that she had never planned to kill anyone and that she had just wanted to make them sick for long enough for her to cover up the fact that she had been stealing from them in order to fund her drug addiction. Velma was only tried for Stuart's murder. The prosecutor at her trial, Joe Freeman Britt, was an ardent advocate of capital punishment, earning him the reputation of the world's deadliest prosecutor. He faced Velma's court-appointed defence attorney, Robert Jacobson, who was defending his first death penalty case. Robert's defence was that Velma was not guilty by reason of insanity caused by her excessive medication abuse. He argued that she had never meant to kill Stuart, rather just make him ill, in order to give her enough time to cover up the thefts and return the money that she had stolen from him. This defence was destroyed by the prosecution, who argued that Stuart could have been saved if the doctors treating him had been made aware that he had been poisoned, and also by bringing in details of the other people who had died at Velma's hands. When the prosecution questioned Velma in court, she came across as argumentative, cold and uncaring, even going so far as giving the prosecutor a sarcastic round of applause at the end of his closing statement. It took the jury less than 60 minutes to find Velma guilty of first degree murder and she was sentenced to death. She was imprisoned in Central Prison in Raleigh, North Carolina, in the area reserved for those who tried to escape or who had mental illnesses. At that time, there was no specific prison area for women on death row. During her time in prison, she was weaned off of the drugs that she had become so dependent on and became a devout Christian. She spent her final years ministering to the other prisoners. Unsuccessful appeals to her death sentence were made, including one made on the basis of testimony by Dorothy Otnow Lewis, a professor of psychiatry at New York University School of Medicine. She was an expert on violent behaviour. She claimed that Velma was suffering from disassociative identity disorder and that Velma had a second personality known as Billy. The professor stated that Billy had told her that Velma had been sexually abused and that he, Billy, had killed the abusers. The judge rejected the appeal stating that, one of them did it, I don't care which one. Velma's fate was sealed and she issued a statement that, I know that everybody has gone through a lot of pain, all the families connected, 
and I am sorry, and I want to thank everybody who have been supporting me all these six years. After a last meal of cheese doodles and Coca-Cola, Velma was executed by lethal injection and pronounced dead at 2.15am on the 2nd of November 1984, four days after her 52nd birthday. At the request of her son, she was buried near his father, Thomas Burke, in a remote cemetery in North Carolina. It is believed that before her death, she confessed to her son, Ronnie, that she had killed Thomas by starting the fire in the bedroom where he was passed out from drinking. Velma was the first woman to be executed in the United States after capital punishment was reintroduced in 1976. She was also the first woman to be executed by lethal injection. That concludes today's case. Please add any comments down below and thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. Singer-songwriter Jonathan Bird is the grandson of Jennings Barfield and his first wife. His song Velma from his Wildflowers album gives a personal account of the murder and investigation. Goodbye.